I'm Dr. Hunter. Uh, I'm here with Dr. Angela Paddock. We're both, you don't have to worry about saying otolaryngology. It's, it's a little bit overboard. You can say ear, nose, and throat surgeons. We're both ear, nose, and throat surgeons. I've been here in Boulder for quite some time with Boulder Medical Center and uh, are happy to talk to you tonight about uh, Inspire Therapy. It's uh, one of the newer treatments that we've been offering for sleep apnea. Uh, it's been out for a number of years now, and we can talk more about that if you, if you like. Uh, but it's been out a number of years now, and we've now had a large, fairly large series of patients who've been very, very successful in it. And uh, we're happy to bring it to Boulder and, and help the patients in this region, uh, really all of Boulder County and, and North Denver and, and whoever else wants to drive up this way as well. Uh, but I'll get into it and we'll start talking about it here. You know, we talk about really sort of the background of it is obstructive sleep apnea is, is fairly pervasive. You know, 20 million Americans with obstructive sleep apnea. And the crux of it is kind of understanding what goes on when we sleep. Uh, most of us have heard of, of REM sleep, whether it be through listening to the band or hearing it somewhere in some movie. But you have the four stages of sleep, and that REM sleep is the last stage and the most restful sleep. And one of the problems with REM sleep, even though it's the most restful, is it's also the most restful in part because of the body relaxes all of its muscles and can't actually voluntarily move any of the muscles other than to try to help you breathe. Um, it's, it's kind of uh, a great restful place. But the problem with the relaxing of those muscles is all of a sudden you see in this picture here, in this example, is the person's tongue can rest in the back of their throat all of a sudden because those muscles relax. And that, even, that doesn't even have to be just that they're sleeping on their back. Even people sleeping on their sides, those muscles relax and fall to the back of the throat. Also, the soft palate, you see with the air coming through the nose, the soft palate can drop back and also obstruct that whole area. And that's why we tend to see our worst sleep apnea during that last stage of sleep. And that's when people tend to uh, obstruct and when you obstruct, we have certain parameters for that, but in general, we call that an apnea. And apneas are not normal. You should not obstruct when you sleep. You should not stop breathing when you sleep. And one of the things that can happen when that happens is obviously you're not getting oxygen into the bloodstream and you're not getting rid of carbon dioxide in the body. And that can lead to some big problems. Mainly, we can measure that with blood oxygen levels or O2 saturation is the other way of putting that. And that's one of the components of a sleep study that you'll see on there. And the example in this case is, you know, here we have somebody who's stopping, essentially stopping sleeping for 47 seconds. Here's another apnea or another apneic episode where they're stopping for 86 seconds. Try imagining when you're awake trying to hold your breath for 86 seconds. That's challenging enough, much less trying to get your oxygen saturation down to 84 or 74% as this patient has, uh, that's practically impossible to do while you're awake. So there you are doing it while you're asleep and you can't really even control it. Um, and so that's one of the big issues with it. All of a sudden you have, obviously, if that's supposed to be your most restful time of sleep and you're not able to get that restful time of sleep because your body can't rest because it's struggling, well, it's going to pop you awake so it can help you breathe or at least bring you into another level of sleep that's not as restful. Uh, but the other thing, obviously, is the stuff we talk about here, your fatigue, accident risk, snoring, all these things go into making things pretty miserable. But moreover, probably why we're here and why we take this so seriously is that it really very much affects the heart and the brain. And when you look at sort of all causes of death, people with, especially with severe sleep apnea, can lose tens of years off their life expectancy just by having untreated severe sleep apnea. So it's not just, oh, my partner snores and I have to sleep in the other room. It's, oh, my partner is actually going to have a decreased life expectancy because of this. So we take it very seriously and we want to treat it. Let me introduce to you Dr. Paddock and she's going to talk a little bit about CPAP, which I bet you all know about anyway. Hey, so yeah, I'm Angie Paddock. 
Um, so basically, you know, a lot of people come to us and they say, well, I snore, I feel bad when I wake up, I don't get good sleep, but they don't even want to go get a sleep study because they don't want CPAP. Um, but I will say that is first-line therapy for the treatment of sleep apnea, and a lot of people do really well with it. Um, and when you use it regularly, um, you get much better rest and you feel, feel a lot better. Um, but sometimes patients cannot acclimate to it. So whether that's because they can't breathe through their nose and they have to pull the mask off, um, whether that's because they have um, some, some nervousness surrounding the mask, whether the mask fogs up and they rip it off at night, there's a lot of reasons. Some people travel a lot, they don't wanna have to carry that thing through the airport all the time. So um, for one reason or another, some people just may not be the right fit for a CPAP. So those are a lot of the patients we see. Um, so there are definitely other therapies for sleep apnea. Um, and so you heard them talking in some of those series initially about the oral appliance. So that's called a mandibular advancement device. And what that does is it's a custom appliance that basically what it does is it pulls your jaw forward, which is interesting because that's kind of what the Inspire does it, but it just does it a little bit better. But um, when you pull the jaw forward, it also pulls the tongue forward. So it's trying to do the same purpose of the uh, Inspire therapy. But that can lead to some TMJ dysfunction, some pain, um, just like the, the patient said before. And so not everybody does well with that, but some people do. Um, secondarily, there are some other surgeries that Mark and I both do very frequently. So that includes you know, septoplasty, rhinoplasty, turbinate reduction, all of those things are to try to improve your breathing through your nose. And sometimes just breathing better through your nose can help you tolerate the CPAP. Um, there are other surgeries that we do, such as tonsillectomy, shortening the palate, um, shrinking down some of the tongue to basically try to improve the airway patency as well. But all these procedures are, have a common goal, which is to help you have a wider space to breathe through at night so you're not collapsing and then obstructing. So basically, y'all are here because you want to hear about CPAP, or <laughs> it's fire. You don't want to wear the CPAP. Um, and so how it works is that it's a very safe procedure. Um, most patients are done outpatient, so they go home the same day. Um, that picture on the left is a picture of the battery pack that sits over the chest, so that's the generator. Um, and so basically how it works is, and Mark's gonna get into this a little bit more, but you've got three incisions. So there's one incision one right under your jawline, um, there's one in the chest, and then there's one down lower in the chest. So basically when you breathe in, the sensor in your chest sends a signal to the stimulator in your tongue. And basically what that does is when you breathe in, which is typically when your tongue would fall back, um, you breathe in, your tongue goes forward. And so what it's doing is opening up that space so you don't have those obstructive episodes, and in essence, you're not having those little micro awakenings that never let you get full restful sleep. So here's Mark. So here's a video of a guy using it, and it's, as they say, already installed, ready to go, and he's settling down to bed, and you'll see he has a remote control that he uses. Now, you don't have to worry your uh, next door neighbor can't get a hold of the remote control and use it. You actually have to press it there. But as Dr. Paddock was mentioning, there's a sensor down in the chest that senses the pull of the muscles, trying to pull air in. And then as it does that, it sends a signal up here to a, gives a signal to the nerve underneath the tongue that helps pull the tongue forward and actually opens up the soft palate a little bit. Um, so every time the chest goes to pull in air, and we can do that again, every time the chest goes to pull in air, you'll see that the tongue will move forward and get up out of the way. The soft palate opens up a little bit. Um, it kind of makes so much sense. Most of us who, who help people with these think about, wow, why didn't I think of that? Because it's doing exactly what needs to happen in order for you not to have sleep apnea. It's opening these things up for you. And so you can see that tongue moves forward every time it, the signal is sent forward there. From there, after you have uh, the sensor here, and they talked about the three small incisions, is what Dr. Paddock was mentioning. Um, every time you go to breathe, even when you're awake, the muscles in your chest have to flex to pull the air in. There's no automatic pump that pushes the air down your throat. It's the chest pulling the air in, it's those muscles. That little sensor down there can sense those muscles flexing. And like we mentioned, it goes up to the generator up here, the battery pack and the brains of the operation, which sends a signal up to the hypoglossal nerve. You'll also, 
you'll hear this referred to as a hypoglossal nerve stimulator. Um, and that's the nerve that we find there and, and get, get it connected to. Uh, three small incisions. There's one under the right jaw, typically the right-hand side. Um, doesn't always have to be. There's occasions where we do it on the other side, but typically the right-hand side, so under the right jaw. Uh, both Dr. Paddock and I do some facial plastic surgery, so we try to make those incisions as small and discreet as possible, and we're pretty successful at that. Another incision over the chest, a few centimeters over the chest, and makes a little pocket there for our Backpackers, we tend to make it maybe a little more toward the center so it's not interfering with your backpack, uh, that sort of thing. We take those into account. Had to change one the other day because a fellow had a tattoo in just a certain place and we didn't want to disturb the tattoo. So there's some flexibility in terms of where we do with that. Um, and then down underneath, sort of underneath the pec muscle, um, we find a spot between two ribs where we slide that sensor or it can feel those muscles that are flexing to do that. Um, the surgery itself, about three hours, you know, give or take. Neither of us ever rush to do any of this stuff, so we make sure we have plenty of time and, and are comfortable doing this. Um, and for most people, you're going home that day, you know, within a couple hours of, of the procedure being done. Um, there's you know, the, everybody has a different sort of sense of discomfort and pain after a procedure, and I've had patients who just take some Tylenol, and I've had patients who needed heavier duty stuff, like maybe a Percocet or something like that afterward, and so that's fairly common to sort of try to figure out what works for most people. Um, for, we try to do, keep you with non-strenuous activities, you know, actually keep things pretty calm for the first few days. In fact, Often for a week or so, we'll have you wear an arm sling just to remind you not to do too much action with there because we want to keep these things settled. And then for about, after about a month, you can, you can get back to all your usual activities. Um, but usually after about a week or two, you know, you're up and around, you're doing your usual activities, but maybe you're not doing golf yet, or maybe you're not rock climbing yet, or maybe not playing rugby yet. So those are the things we're kind of like trying to hold off on until everything's healed. Uh, after that, we'll talk a little bit more about what happens after the surgery, but you also have about an 11-year battery life. And, you know, a lot of this in terms of the implant technology and the outer parts of it, it's based on what we've been doing for decades with pacemakers. Um, and so we know that if a pacemaker battery runs out, we make a little incision, we pull the, the battery unit out and replace that. Same thing over here, if there's a problem uh, with the battery running out after 10, 11 years, I assume by that time we'll probably have a 20 or 30 year battery life. Um, but we just replace that, again, a little small incision, sneak in there, replace that, probably not even have to touch the other sensors or leads coming into that. Um, and then everybody also, also asks often about, well, what about CT scans? No problem, any CT scans, not an issue. And MRI currently, you try just to not get an MRI of the chest. And so that's the main thing with that. And what else? So after the procedure, about after a month after things have settled down and healed, you go and you see one of the sleep doctors who we work with. And what they do is they can take a look at the device, make sure it's working for you, and they actually activate it at that point. Um, they have a device that they can communicate through the skin with the device. They check and see the tongue movement and the palate movement, make sure it's working right. They have a lot of parameters they can work with to change that to make sure it's working. They send you off, they teach you about how to use the remote control, and you're off, off and running. Usually it takes a number of weeks to actually get this settled out and get it sorted out so it's working just right for you. And we have your people take it slow and easy early on in terms of activating it, using it every night, and then over time getting it a little more activation energy so that it's much more effective and it's appropriately effective for each person. Um, that'll often involve another sleep study, but it's mainly to make sure just everything's working for it. And from there, I'll have Dr. Paddock tell you about sort of some of our data. Yeah, so basically, um, people want to know how well this thing works. So um, we have shown that um, there's an 80% reduction in AHI typically. So AHI is how many times per hour that you, 
either stop breathing or have a decrease in your airflow of breathing. So um, Inspire is indicated for people that have moderate to severe sleep apnea, so it's not something that you're gonna do for a very mild sleep apnea. Um, obviously, this is just obstructive sleep apnea, so it's not gonna work for central apnea, which is a different thing. Um, but so if you see this in their major trial that they did, um, I think back in 2014, but the average AHI for people undergoing Inspire was about a 30, so that's you know just on the verge of, of severe sleep apnea. And after Inspire, the average um, AHI was six. So that's a great number. They showed in that STAR trial that about 75% of patients had a cure, or what they considered a cure, was an AHI of under 20, um, or a greater than 50% reduction in their AHI. So that's pretty good. Um, also, people ask me a lot, Anna, am I gonna stop snoring? So I don't wanna um, tell on anyone, but a lot of people come to see us mainly because their bed partner is annoyed at them <laughs> for snoring. Um, so they may not necessarily wanna come, but their partner's kinda urging them to do it. So they wanna know if this is gonna help that. So about 83% um, of patients are snoring before this, because again, you're obstructing and you're having kinda that collapse in your throat. Um, and after Inspire, 10% of people still snore, um, but it's usually less um, severe and less loud. Um, and it's significantly better than it was before. So there's about an 88% reduction in snoring. Big question is, do they like it, do they use it? Um, and I, we know that national data actually tends to show that it, with CPAP, maybe only about 50% of people tolerate it. And so that's, that's kind of the big number we're comparing it to. And when you look at this, you're seeing 94% of people are giving positive feedback or are satisfied. Uh, and you have a small percentage of people who are unsatisfied or a couple people that are in between there. Uh, that's, that's huge in terms of having people comply with it and comply with treatment and keep using it. Um, so if you're happy with it, you're going to keep using it. If you're not happy with it, say like other treatments, you're going to have a tougher time continuing using it throughout your life. Um, and then you talk about, you know, do patients use it and the average patient uh, after they did this trial and looked at it, the average patient is using it about six hours a night. So it's not like, it's not one of those things that you can pull off your mask in the middle of the night. Um, it's it's going to keep going. And most people, you know, when you talk to them, they're finding, oh, I pull off my mask while I'm asleep. I don't realize it. Well, this, you don't have to worry about that. It'll actually keep working no matter what position you sleep in or where you flip-flop. Uh, we, there's a number of stire, st no, excuse me, studies that they've looked at, and you know we have 100 peer review, and probably even more than that now, because this data is a couple of you know, years or so old. Um, but we have a lot of people enrolled in the registries that are doing very, very well with this, and they're keeping very good track of it. Um, since it has been clinically proven and shown to be an appropriate therapy for the right patient. Uh, most all of our insurances are now covering it, and that includes uh, Medicare, VA, you know, all the major insurers out there, United Health, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Cigna, and so forth. Uh, we really haven't had too much trouble anymore over the last year or two getting this, this covered for the appropriate patient. I'll have Dr. Paddock talk about this for us. So basically, this is just asking, you know, who's a candidate for Inspire? Um, oops, I, okay. So like I said, you have to have moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea. So basically, um, that is an AHI range of 15 or over. Um, and they don't really have a very, you know, standard upper limit, but kind of 65 is around that. If it's higher than that, you know, even if you get a 50% reduction, you're still in the severe range. So um, that's kind of a, a different thing. So you also have to have less than 25% of central sleep apnea episodes. Um, and so that's something we look at as well. Um, you don't get consistent benefit from CPAP. So everybody asks us that, do I have to try CPAP? Yeah, you do have to try CPAP for at least a little while. And to be honest with you, some people do it and they say, actually, this is good enough. I don't want to do surgery. But a lot of people don't like it, and so they come back and, and, and want to talk about the Inspire again. Um, you have to be not significantly overweight. So basically, they calculate your BMI, um, which is your body mass index, and it has to be under 35. So um, that's basically just because that can affect sleep apnea as well. Um, pass an airway anatomy exam. So this is something that when you come see us, Mark and I are going to take a look. We're going to look at your anatomy. We're going to look at your sleep study and say, okay, maybe you'd be a candidate. 
Once we decide that you're a candidate based on those things, what you have to do is called a DICE. So it's a drug-induced sleep endoscopy. What that is is basically us taking you to the operating room, and it's a very minimal procedure. It takes about five minutes, but we have to get you asleep enough so that you start snoring, and we want to see you obstructing. So um, as you saw in the video that Mark showed, basically this pulls the palate and the tongue base forward. So we want to make sure that we're putting an inspire in a patient that's going to have benefit from this. So the dice basically takes a look at the top part of the palate and the tongue and makes sure that when you are snoring, that's what's collapsing. So that's what the dice does, is it confirms that that's the positioning um, and that the inspire is actually going to help you. So once we do that and decide that you're a candidate for that, then we get started with, you know, set up for the inspire. Um, you also have to be 18 or older, so this is not indicated for pediatric patients. Um, basically, you can go to inspiresleep.com. They've actually got a great website. They've got a great um, patient advocacy program where they talk to you about um, pretty much everything. So if you want more information, um, you can go to inspiresleep.com. Um, they have an app, actually, which is kind of cool. Um, it talks about how it works. It has some of these videos. It has common questions. Um, and it has instructional videos on how to use the Inspire. And I was going to add kind of with turning it on, it's kind of cool because basically when you get it activated, which I think this will be in the app as well, but they kind of have, you know, this little hand piece, you hold it to the generator and that turns it on. So they'll ask you when they turn it on, they say, how long does it take you to fall asleep? So if it takes you 15 minutes, they set it for 15 minutes. If it takes you an hour, they'll set it for an hour. And so the purpose of that is so that you don't turn it on and it immediately starts. You basically turn it on, you have that lag period, you're able to fall asleep kind of like you normally would without anything affecting you, um, and then it turns on when you're already asleep. And so that's kind of that ramp up period where people start low and go slow, but they get up to that kind of peak number that helps them the most, um, and they don't even feel it at that point. So uh, that is kind of a cool thing and super beneficial. So if you want more information, both um, Mark and I work at Boulder Medical Center. We have four locations. Um, both of us have an office in Boulder. Um, and then I go to Longmont one day a week and Mark goes to Louisville one day a week. So we have a pretty wide reach. So if anybody wants to come see us, we'd love to chat. Um, and we'll take questions. Great, thank you so much. We have a, a, quite a few questions. And let's just get started with one. Uh, a, a viewer asked uh, and said that we camp and backpack quite a bit, sometimes at higher elevations. Would the higher elevations affect the way Inspire works? It should not. Um, so the only issue with higher elevations, we know this in Boulder and Denver and our folks who are living up in the foothills and even higher, that of course we have less oxygen here. That won't affect how the Inspire device works at all, um, and that's one of the big things people like about it is, yeah, you can go camping with it, you can go backpacking with it, and all you're, all you're carrying around with you is just a little remote control. Um, so it should not affect that at all. Great. Um, a question, uh, it says, I have a pacemaker implant. Will Inspire interfere with my pacemaker? So it won't actually, I've done a patient who had a pacemaker. Um, so that's why we mostly go on the right because the pacemakers are typically on the left. Um, and any, even in patients that don't have a pacemaker, we don't want it to ever be confused for a pacemaker. But yeah, the um, mechanics of it are totally different, so it's not gonna interfere. Yeah. Great. Does this device work for a mouth breather? Yes. <laughs> so I mean, that's kind of a, like a super broad question because yeah. people mouth breathe for a lot of reasons. Um, but I'd probably say if you have obstructive sleep apnea, then the Inspire could work if you meet those criteria. Um, but there could be other things going on causing you mouth yeah. breathes. I've had uh, two patients that were mouth breathers and they weren't getting as much benefit that we wanted from the Inspire implant. And really they're, they're mouth breathers because they could not breathe through their nose. So we actually went ahead and did a septoplasty, opened up the nose, did some little grafts in the outside of the nose to make sure everything was open, and it helped them tremendously. So most people, I think it's not absolutely not a problem if you're a mouth breather. Uh, the good news about doing any of the nose procedures is they're really well tolerated, they're fairly simple, um, and they're very, very effective in terms of getting people to breathe better through their nose. And it's more comfortable to breathe through your nose. Oh boy, is it more comfortable <laughs> to breathe through so, your nose, yeah, once right. you get used to it, yeah. Um, is there a risk for people over the age of 80? Um, I mean, there's the general risk of surgery. So, I mean, I think that risk potentially goes up. I mean, obviously, 
If you have other factors, you know, such as heart disease or high blood pressure or COPD, stuff like that, I mean, that could be a risk for anyone at any age, although typically the older you are, maybe the more likely you are to have that. But there's not like an age indication where you won't be a candidate because you're 85. I see. What if you travel and you forget your remote control? So you can't use the Inspire. Yeah, <laughs> if you forget your remote control, you're kind of stuffed at that point. Yeah. You, you, you have can get your, a new one, but... As you have your, your spouse or friend or somebody FedEx it to you wherever yeah. you're traveling. All righty. Um, does it work with someone with a small esophagus? Yes. An especially small spot. Uh, yes. Yeah. So what do your patients tell you it feels like when this turns on? At bedtime. Yeah, I was going to say, it's, people early on say they can, they can feel it. Um, they notice like maybe a slight little, not even a twinge, but they can, they can definitely feel it early on. But over time, over the first several weeks as they're getting used to it, most people say they don't even notice anymore. They can't even, can't even feel it. One of the things you can do is say if you get up in, in the middle of the night and have to go to the bathroom or let the dog out or something like that, you take your remote you can pause it and it gives you however much you preset it for, 20, 30 minutes to pause it and you then can go back to bed. Um, I've heard patients talk about that they often don't pause it or forget to pause it just because they don't notice it happening um, or they'll not turn it off in the morning. Normally it's set to turn off in the morning after say seven or eight hours of sleep but if they get up before that and they forget to turn it off because they're not even feeling it, um, they'll notice they have maybe a little more of a stutter when they talk because when they go to breathe in, their tongue's going to move. Um, and then they remember to turn it off. But it will turn off automatically. Say so you jump in your car and take off, it'll turn off automatically um, after that seven to eight hour set. And the, and the cool thing about what Mark said is basically, you know, you start at a low level. So, I mean, you know, once they turn it on, they started at a level one and you have up to a level 10 to get to. And so, you know, that level one is super minimal. I mean, that's just the most minimal stimulation that you feel and we see. Um, and so over time, your body kind of acclimates to it and you get used to it and you don't yeah. feel it. Excellent. <clears throat> uh, is there a problem going through security detectors? <laughs> no, I, right now what you see is, is the TSA and so forth. They're so used to people with pacemakers. You do get a card that has, you can keep in your wallet that says, hey, I have, I have an implant over here. Uh, but the TSA and the, the airports are so used to pacemakers at this point that, it, that it's not been an issue for any of my patients. Great. Um, how large and how visible is the scar from the incision on the chest? So each scar is five centimeters. So, um, you know, five centimeters here, five centimeters here, and five centimeters here. It's funny because I've had a couple of patients where I've done it and they say, oh, that's a bigger scar than I thought. It's funny because I always say, oh, it's going to be five centimeters. But once you have it, maybe it looks a little bit bigger. But, um, you know, it's, it's really not big. I mean, that's what, two inches. So yeah. it's, and honestly, it heals very nicely. You know, more than the scar, sometimes people notice the kind of protuberance of the um, generator. So it kind of looks like a pacemaker in that it sits out a little bit. Um, but the scar is usually not an issue. Yeah. Uh, a question here, breast cancer reconstruction with silicone breast implants. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can you use this device? Absolutely. Um, and what you, we would talk about modifying the procedure a little bit and either of us can talk about that. Um, I've done a couple of the procedures where we've changed, and I won't go into specifics, but we've changed where we've put the sensing lead. Um, so we don't have to violate any of the breast tissue or the implants. Excellent. How long do you have to try CPAP before you can be a candidate for Inspire? <laughs> you know, actually, that's a good question. Um, I think you just have to give it a good old try. So yeah, <laughs> if that's two weeks, I don't I, know. <laughs> I, had, I, had, I had feedback from one of the insurance companies that they wanted somebody on it for at least a month. Okay. And, you know, that's a month of... You know, your CPAP machine will keep track of how often you're using, how much you're using it. And so I think they just wanted some documentation that you gave at the old college try. They had it on most nights or something like that, at least for a few minutes to an hour or however long. Uh, that being said, that was the only time I've really had anybody query about how long the patient tried it and needed documentation for that. It's kind of interesting because CPAP compliance is considered like five nights a week for over four hours which is considered like CPAP success. But to me, 
I need way more than four hours of sleep. So, you yeah. know, most people, even if they're working at four hours, you know, they rip it off halfway through the night and they still have to sleep for four hours um, and still don't feel great. Yeah, well, interestingly, we were talking about it before that four hours of sleep or that four hours of CPAP use, that's purely a number made up by the insurance companies to evaluate for CPAP compliance. There's no data behind that to say that's an appropriate amount of time to use your CPAP. Um, so it's just, it's just a hoop to jump through, really. Uh, is there an issue with swimming or lying out in the sun with this device? Nope. No, the only thing I would say is for the scars, you want to keep sunscreen on it, especially the first six months. Yeah. Just because it'll get really red if you don't. Yeah. All right. I understand it's for patients that have either failed CPAP or intolerant to CPAP. Does intolerance basically mean it's bothersome and for some reason or another I no longer can use it? Pretty much. It's pretty much, yeah. I mean, honestly, people say, well, technically could I tolerate it? Yes. Do I want to tolerate it? <laughs> no. I mean, I think you have to say more than just, oh, it works perfectly, but I don't like it. I mean, some people say I can't breathe well through my nose. I'm claustrophobic. I travel a lot. I mean, there are a lot of reasons to have it, um, be intolerant, but most any reason is going to be okay. Now, we, we have had some people who have diagnosed PTSD or anxiety or claustrophobia who, who just, there's no way they can get that mask on their face. It's just not going to happen, mm -hmm. especially if we have that documented. Mm -hmm. um, that CPAP rule gets to be a little bit fluid. Sometimes we can push it out of the way and move past that. After I get the implant, how long until I can return to normal activities and normal exercise? Probably about a month. So, I mean, you know, Mark talked a little bit about this. For about, you know, a couple days, you have probably have 40 hours, you have your arm in a sling, and that's mainly because you've got this lead that goes from the chin incision to the upper chest incision and then down to the lower chest incision. And so you kind of want to let that scar in and really heal before you start doing a ton of arm mobility. Um, but within a month, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, I have patients who, you know, certainly that first week afterward, you're up and around, you're walking, you're doing your stuff. Um, I have patients that'll go for a light hike or maybe a light jog or something like that. Certainly after a week or two, getting back to cardio, getting back to regular activities is pretty normal. What we tend to say, where the guideline tends to steer us is if you're having to do an activity that requires you to raise your elbow above your shoulder to get that arm above the shoulder, then we say, eh, hold off for a month for that. Mm -hmm. And that's also any big arm movements. You know, yeah, and golf, we talk about baseball. golf, baseball, lacrosse, rock climbing, something like that where you're doing big arm movements. Uh, a viewer asks, ooh, it just went away. <laughs> uh, yes. Is there a wire connecting the three components or does the Inspire operate wirelessly? There's yeah. a wire. Um, so we talked about, we make the little incision under here and there's actually a device um, that's meant, that's just purpose built to help slide the wire up under the tissue planes uh, to the device and same thing, we slide the wire down underneath here. So it doesn't have to be a big incision or anything, there's just a way to, we have a little device that helps slide it right under the tissues can't feel it, can't see it, you know, nothing like that because it's deep enough for that. Do you know if uh, Medicaid covers this Medicaid procedure? does not cover this. It does, right? does not cover this at this point, this, yeah. yeah. Okay. Medicare does, but Medicaid does not. Uh, I've been a patient at uh, Colorado Sleep Institute for a lot of years. Why have I never been told about this? <laughs> <laughs> well, so there's a couple of answers to that question. So number one, Mark and I started doing this maybe a year and a half ago in Boulder. So Inspire actually is a cool company in that they really are fairly specific about who does it and what community they bring it into, and that's because they want it to be a successful program. So you know, Mark and I were super excited to be able to bring it to Boulder. So part of it is that. Part of it is that, you know, I mean, each of us have our niche and we like what we do and so we're gonna promote what we do. So I don't wanna say that in you know, a negative way, but I mean, Mark and I enjoy doing surgery, so we do Inspire. Um, but the sleep study people or the, the medical doctors for sleep apnea at the Sleep Institute, they're gonna push CPAP first. And honestly, that is the right thing to do because CPAP is the first line treatment. Um, but 
you know, I think as this procedure has become more prominent, more people at the Sleep uh, Institute have kind of gotten on board that this can be a good option for their patients. Yeah, and most of our most of the patients we see, we actually do in conjunction with Colorado Sleep Institute. Mm -hmm. We're they're an excellent partner that we've worked with, and they do a very nice job helping us manage. Uh, the the settings of the device and working forward with the device that's that's what they're excellent at and that's actually they they probably see more than we do honestly because um, they see mm -hmm. you before for the sleep study they're the ones actually that activate it and then they're the ones going to see you back after surgery um, to get a, a post op sleep study so um, we work a lot yeah. with them how long should I take off of work after the surgery. I usually tell people a week. Yeah, about a week. It depends on the type of work. I have a lot of people who are, uh, you know, maybe a software engineer and they're working from home. I would say, well, maybe a couple of days just so you're not feeling loopy from the anesthesia and you're not uncomfortable. You don't have any, any pain or anything like that. So if you're, you know, at a desk job. Now, if you're landscaping, then we have to look at those rules and say, okay, maybe it's going to be a couple of weeks till you can really get back to mm -hmm. full action. Uh, but it really depends on the activity that you're doing at work. But certainly for a lot of us who are you know, working at a desk or something like that, usually at the most, you know, a week. Is there a way to talk to a patient that's already been implanted? Absolutely. Um, we have patients that probably would be willing to do that, but the nice thing is uh, Inspire provides that service. Um, I don't know if they have their... I think it was on the up wall. there. I think if you go to their website, yeah. um, you can actually contact them and and get in touch with people. They have uh, patient advocates, and they also have have patients that have been implanted that have have volunteered to talk about this. And we both have patients. I think that would be willing as well. Yeah. Oh yeah. There we go. That's okay. what I was thinking about. Does the surgery require general anesthesia? It does. Yep, it does. Excellent. If I have mixed sleep apnea, both obstructive and central, can I still get the device and will it work for me? So you can get the device if your central component is less than 25%. So, you know, again, Mark said we worked with the sleep clinic often, and most of our patients are from the sleep clinic. And so um, someone said, oh, I haven't heard about Inspire yet, but maybe you're not at that point. But we have um, patients sent us, and they really only send us patients that they've already looked at those things. So they've kind of determined their candidacy, and they say, this is a great patient for Inspire. I'm pretty sure that you uh, covered this, but uh, can a person get an MRI with this implant? Yes, so you can get MRIs. I think the only one that is not indicated completely is a chest MRI, um, but anything of MRI of, of anything else is, is fine. Yeah, I would think if there's an absolute need, I, I deal with cochlear implants as well for the ear. Uh, if there's an absolute need, you had to have a chest MRI, you could take the battery pack out and at that point, secure things enough that we could get an MRI of the chest if it had to be done. Okay. What if your body mass index increases to over 35 after the installation? <laughs> I um, think, well, probably what would happen is with, you know, in conjunction with Colorado Sleep Institute is we'd make sure uh, via another sleep study if things really, you know, if there's a significant weight gain or if all of a sudden you're symptomatic again where you're not uh, getting restful sleep or your partner noticed that all of a sudden you're snoring much more, that sort of thing, we'd probably look at another sleep study, see what's going on, and then pro likely be able to tailor the amount of activation energy for the device and see if they, it could be increased to help cover that. Um, it's, it's not something that we've had to deal with a lot, fortunately, uh, but it is certainly something over time I think we're going to see a little bit more of. But I, I could anticipate that, you know, yes, BMI is a factor, but it's not the factor in determining whether you have sleep apnea or not. So where does the remote control go while I'm sleeping? Do you have to keep it near you or? Can so you actually just... don't. Once you turn it on, you can just kind of leave it on the you know nightstand by you, um, so you don't have to like carry it around. But 
again, you know, if you if you get up to go to the bathroom or something, you want to pause it. You need to have the remote near you to be able to change the settings or do what you need to do. Um, but it's not like if you forget it in the kitchen, it's not going to work. Yeah. Okay. What is the longest someone has had one of these installed, and are there any long-term concerns? I mean, like long, they've, well, so what happened is probably, what, 10, <laughs> maybe more like 14 years ago now, because um, time flies by, but about 10 to 15 years ago, uh, this first was rolled out in Europe. And so I have a feeling our, our longest standing implants are probably somewhere in Europe. Uh, things got going well for the, all the trials and studies that they did in Europe and brought it to the United States eh, approximately five to ten years ago. Uh, and that was mainly brought in under sort of study circumstances where they were following patients very closely. So probably in the United States. You know, so 2014 was when yeah, it was FDA approved. So FDA approved in 2014, but they were probably looking at it even before that. And there haven't been any adverse no. no. Situation. You know, we talk about the risks. This is something that always comes up too, and we talk through this extensively before we ever do a procedure. But the risk to any procedure out there, any surgery, getting a shot, you have three risks um, bleeding, nerve injury, infection. Um, and that's with any procedure out there. With this, fortunately, we're not near any major blood vessels, really, so there's not really a big risk. They're, they're fairly superficial incisions. So we're not at a big risk of having any bleeding during surgery. Um, you know, even afterward, I've not seen any bleeding incidents or problems with that, but that's certainly a risk. Uh, nerve injury, well, we're messing with the nerve up here under the chin, but Dr. Paddock and I haven't had any patients that have had any paralysis of that nerve or any problems with that nerve over the time. Uh, and so I think that risk is fairly minimal. I suppose you get a little numbness around some of the incisions. That's about it. Um, infection, I don't think either of us have had anybody that's had any issues with infection at all. You do get antibiotics at the time of surgery and, uh, and so forth. So that's, that's not been an issue with any of our patients so far. Uh, this guest said, I'm using a CPAP for at least 60 days. Uh, my AHI averages between 10 and 15. Would I see improvement if I was on Inspire? Well, that's a complicated question, I guess. I mean, so that sounds like the CPAP is working. So I guess the question is, do you tolerate the CPAP? Um, and do you feel like you sleep better and you're more rested? So an HI of 10 to 15 is still mild sleep apnea. So I guess, you know, it's hard to know that for sure without seeing your prior sleep study to know where you were before. Yeah. Uh, can you sleep in any position and is it act, work well or do you have to stay on your back? Yeah, it should. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be any problems. You can sleep in any position? Yeah, any position. Uh, if I were to set up an appointment to see you, Dr. Paddock or Dr. Hunter, for next week, let's say, how long until I could actually get the device? Mm. Well, so mm. like we talked about, you have to do the DICE procedure. So that's one procedure we set you up for, and it kind of depends on our schedule. Um, but hopefully within a month or so. <laughs> and then we start the Inspire process for uh, insurance. So typically that takes a month or less. Yeah. So maybe two months. Yeah, maybe two months to get in there. It also depends on how recent your sleep study yeah. was. So yeah, sometimes we have to repeat sleep studies and so forth. And, so, and then sometimes, like she said, insurance can be... Uh, sticky on it, although they're getting much, much better and quicker at it. And that's a good point, actually. So you need a sleep study, depending on the insurance, within two to three years. And so, you know, if you come see us and your last sleep study was 10 years ago, we're going to probably send you to the sleep clin clinic, um, the Colorado Sleep Institute, and have you talk to them, get a new sleep study, and kind of start that process. And so it may be beneficial also to talk to the sleep study ahead of time, or sleep clinic ahead of time, um, to kind of get that ball rolling as well because that's a lot of times a main delayer. Mm -hmm. So we have time for a couple of more questions. I'm going to um, ask this one. Um, so how long after the surgery until we can, until we turn on the device and I can start using the sleep remote? So it's usually four to six weeks. So you didn't, wouldn't turn it on earlier than four weeks. Um, and that's because we just want to let everything heal. You know, you want the nerve to kind of, it's got that cuff on it. You want everything to heal normally um, before you start using it. 
So about a month. Yeah. yeah okay. All righty. Well, I believe that's all the time we have for tonight. And I am going to thank you very much for all your your time and expertise tonight. It was very informative, and we really mm -hmm. appreciate it. I know all of you out there appreciate our doctors tonight. And so a recording of tonight's lecture will be available on bch.org live stream uh, in a day or so. Um, so you can rewatch uh, and rehear the questions and answers uh, in a day or so. Uh, you'll also receive a post lecture survey by email. Please take a minute to fill out that questionnaire. The hospital's very interested in your feedback on these lectures. And once again, please visit bch.org for information on the COVID-19 vaccination uh, latest updates. Thank you for joining us and have a good night. Thank you. Bye. In our morning rounds, a treatment offering hope for millions of sleep apnea patients. The disorder causes people to stop breathing when they're asleep. An estimated 22 million Americans suffer from sleep apnea. It puts them at greater risk for diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and memory loss. Patients who are older, overweight, and male are generally most at risk. David Begno shows us the new option helping some patients. David, good morning. Nor good morning. For those who struggle with sleep apnea, treatments like the CPAP machine can be hard to sleep with. They don't always work. And a lot of people just can't get a full night's sleep with it. But now there's a new FDA-approved device called Inspire, and it's gaining popularity. For some people, it's a last resort. Their life literally depends on it. The Cleveland Clinic named this kind of treatment number two on its list of top medical innovations for 2018. We met a woman who finally found relief after more than two decades of trying to get a good night's rest. I wasn't breathing. I wasn't getting the correct amount of oxygen. My thought process had gone. Good job! Peggy Saravo's memory got so bad, her family thought she had dementia. The 59-year-old was so exhausted, she says she could barely do her job as a nurse. So people were noticing it, but you were too. I was too. You knew something wasn't right. I knew, not as quickly as they did, but I knew I was in trouble. Peggy has severe obstructive sleep apnea, where her throat muscles relax, blocking her airway and disrupting her sleep. On average, she stops breathing 53 times an hour. That's nearly once every minute during a night's sleep. Give me an example of a night. Up four hours, maybe sleep two. This is the area where I would sleep. Oxygen, Oxygen machine, correct. CPAP. Correct. Order. She tried other Close treatments. It. Take the mask, bring it over my yeah. face like this. She did not find relief from the CPAP machine, a common treatment that delivers constant pressurized air. The CPAP wasn't getting the right. job done, so you needed exactly. oxygen on top of that. Exactly. And then that didn't work. And that's when they introduced me to Inspire and saved my life. Inspire is a pacemaker-like device implanted in the chest. It senses when your breathing slows down and sends an electric pulse to the tongue to stimulate it forward, keeping the airway open. This has been revolutionary. It's been a game changer. Dr. Malritz Boone is Peggy's doctor at Thomas Jefferson Memorial Hospital in Philadelphia. She'd given up. She had memory issues. She was miserable. This is not a benign disease. As I said, this is a killer, and it actually shortens people's lives. I didn't realize I had it so bad. A few months after having the Inspire device implanted. You just need to relax and breathe normally. Peggy went to a sleep lab to see how it was working. Right, so listen for me on the intercom, okay? Okay, great. Good night. They ran tests throughout the night, and early the next morning, Dr. Boone revealed the results. So before we activated the device, we have all sorts of problems. This is basically your brain saying, I'm not breathing, I need to do something about it. And after we activate the device, it's perfect. Look at your oxygen. Nice, stable, flat line, staying around 96, 97 percent. So this is as good as it gets. Okay. And as far as I'm concerned, this is a cure. This is awesome. A study in the New England Journal of Medicine found that more than two-thirds of patients experience less sleep apnea after getting the implant. 
It was like sleeping with a herd of elephants. For years, all Peggy and her husband David wanted <laughs> was a good night's rest. And now they're finally getting it. I'm going to show you. Every night, Peggy turns on the implant right before going to sleep. So. What's it like to sleep now? Great. Turn myself on. I go to sleep, and I sleep, and then I get up, and I turn myself off, and I have a normal day like you and everybody else. Come, Come here, here Max. Boy. Come here, Doodles. It doesn't work for everybody, boy. but man, it worked for you. It sure did. It saved my life. I love the ball. Let it go. Now, Inspire is not for everyone. It's only for moderate to severe cases like Peggy. And like any surgery, there is a risk of infection. For Peggy, she says her memory is back to 100%, and she's sleeping great at night. And yeah. is insurance covering? So insurance, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Her doctor had to kind of nudge the insurance company along, but they do. Well, she must really love her husband after saying on national TV, it sounds like a herd of elephants. They're <laughs> sleeping together. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that is really great news. Yeah. So does she Good have to wear the mask too. when she's got the implant? No, not no. anymore. Not anymore. Wow. And when she turns it on, she feels nothing. She can just feel it pulsating her tongue forward. It's like a life-saving. Oh, it is. Yeah, Absolutely. That's great. Mm -hmm.